I'm switching gears. I was going to originally talk about um, affordability, but I'm changing it a little bit because of some things that have happened in the last week. And it seems like we're getting a lot more, there, there certainly, is, I don't know if you're feeling it or not, I'm curious, I'm seeing a lot more activity. What are you seeing in terms of activity? Are you seeing more, less, same? What are you seeing? Yes. More? Yeah. More? Yeah. more? A little bit more? So, so? A lot on the fence, yeah. Well, st yeah, still people on the fence, no question about it. Yeah. But one of the things that I have picked up on in the past, um, you're welcome to come sit over here too, guys, yeah. if you need. Uh, one of the things that I've picked up on in the last week, why I've changed going talking from affordability to what I'm going to talk about today, has to do with the kind of questions that I've been getting. And for whatever reason, all of a sudden, I started getting questions about closing costs again. And a few weeks ago, we went through this document here, which I'm not going to go back through again because you've all seen it. We can go, I can go over individually. But I thought, Let's talk about that because it's terribly misleading. And a lot of the calls I was getting this week, in fact, I had four in the last week, and that's what prompted me to want to do this is, Greg, people are wondering about why their closing costs are so high. Now, I'm getting the call because they spoke to another lender. They didn't speak to me, they spoke to a different lender, and that lender gave them some obnoxious number. Well, it's not that the lender was wrong but they all think in terms of closing costs. And then the real estate agent gets the phone call, you get the phone call saying, you know, the borrower is freaked out because they're thinking my closing costs are gonna be five or $6,000, maybe $4,000, and all of a sudden, they've gotta have $13,000 in closing expenses. And they don't understand why. And the real estate agent then picks up the phone and calls me. And I'm not the one who even submitted it. It was someone else. And they call me and say, Greg, why would it be so high? So I thought, OK, let's take a moment and go through what the customer sees from most lenders so that when that question comes to you, you understand it. Then I'm going to give you a tool to eliminate the question, why are my closing expenses so high? So first of all, let's just take a look what the customer sees. Now, this is a closing disclosure. When they first get this from their lender, they get something called a loan estimate. It's basically the same form. Now, it's in a little different format, but it's basically the same thing. So they get a, they get a loan estimate. Now, I don't personally send out loan estimates until the loan has already started. Because when someone wants to get it, the loan estimate is confusing. That's why I'm going to show you this. So we're going to slide this down a little bit. And you're going to see why it's so confusing to the borrower. Because remember, all these different things are closing costs, prepaids, escrows, homeowners associations, and down payment. But here's what the borrower sees. Look at this. Bauer sees closing costs here of $9,734.26. Closing costs aren't that high. That's their total closing expenses in this particular estimate. So the borrower sees this and says, wait a minute once, but I thought they were going to be $4,000. Well, let's break this down. This is what, and this is a government document. Lenders don't have a choice. We have to send this kind of stuff out. So we take a look at this, and this is actually somewhat accurate. This takes into account the lender costs, all right? In this particular case, it had some small discount on it. Then it takes into account all of this, and it lumps it all together. This is your appraisal, credit report, third-party fees. They call them items borrower did not shop for because it's basically dictated in the contract or by someone else. Um, this shows the fees to who they're going. 
Then it takes these fees, puts, lumps that in there. Then it takes these fees, lumps it in there. Then it takes this, lumps it in there. And it comes up with this ridiculous total of over $9,000. And the borrower is freaked out. I mean, we got to bear in mind, the borrowers, they are not in our business. They're not in your business. They're not in my business. All they know is, oh, I was told my closing costs are going to be $4,000 or $5,000. And in this example, it's some obnoxious number, 90, almost $10,000. $10,000 is actually pretty reasonable. All right? This one's a little bit lower because of the fact the taxes are a little bit lower. But the borrower sees that and then gets all nervous and calls you. So this document does not break down the costs in the exact same manner as what we have here. Now, they are broke down in there somewhere, but they're not broke down the same way. So as a result of that, when the borrower gets what's called their loan estimate, that's where it looks, oh my gosh, where's that coming from? The other thing that happens in a loan estimate, if we go down to escrows, we go down here, you'll notice over here that it says there is a aggregate adjustment. Lenders are only allowed, servicers that is, are only allowed to hold so much money in escrow at any given time during the year. There's an actual formula that's built into all of the lenders, they all use the same system, all use the same formula, that tells the servicer how much money they're allowed to hold at any given time. If you go over a certain amount, then you have to reduce the amount you're gonna carry. So what happens, when we put in the final numbers on the, on the closing disclosure, it calculates this here called an aggregate estimate because it says these numbers here, the 405 and 1258, if we collected that every single month for 12 months and we start with, in this example, seven months and three months, we're gonna have too much money. We're not allowed to. So what the system does, it says, okay, lender, you're gonna collect three, you're gonna collect seven, we're going to adjust it, this number here. On the loan estimate that the borrower gets at the time of application or at the time they're going through and shopping, it doesn't have an aggregate estimate in it. The lender simply puts in three months or seven months, whatever it happens to be, and whatever that is, that comes over here without the aggregate estimate. So the number gets even more exaggerated. That's why the borrowers freak out. So, and this obviously, as you know, prepaid interest is gonna be based on when the loan closes, if it closes at the beginning of the month or at the end of the month, which by the way, let's take just a moment. If you are closing a loan on the second, third, or fourth of a month, do you know that you can have drastically different prepaid interest? Anybody know why? If you're closing on the second, third, or fourth of the month. It's a short pay because you're not accruing as much. Thank you, short pay, something called a short pay. If you're closing on the second, third, or fourth of the month, remember, interest on mortgages is always paid in arrears. So when the borrower makes their March house payment, it pays the interest that accrued in the month of February. They make the April payment, and it pays the interest accrued the previous month. If you close on the second, third, or fourth of the month, the lender will allow you to make the payment the first of the following month. So if I, like I've got a closing coming up, in fact, I think this, no, not this one. We have a closing coming up on the 2nd or 3rd of March. And what we did, because the borrower was short funds, is we set up what Jeff just said is a short pay. In other words, his first payment is going to be April the 1st instead of May the 1st. But because he's going to make an April 1st house payment 
and April 1st house payment means he's paying interest for the whole month of March, but we're not closing him until I think the second or the third, which means we actually owe him a credit of one or two days. So if I'm closing on the second, I got to give him one day credit. If I'm closing on the third, I got to give him two days credit. The way the rules work, I can go all the way out to the fourth of the month, as long as it's not a Saturday or Sunday. I can go all the way out to the fourth of the month and I can give him as much as a three day credit. Now, some people say, I don't want to do that. I'd rather, I'll pay the interest and then I'll make my first payment. You know, instead of April 1st in this example, I'll make it May 1st, which is fine. But now you can see the difference. If I'm going to give him a three day credit at closing versus charging him for 27 days of interest in the month, that's a huge dollar difference. So this prepaid interest number, where is it, right here, it's prepaid, can be very different if you're closing on the second, third, or fourth. So it's a little, a little opportunity sometimes that we can take. Now, before I go on, any questions? Because this document is so totally confusing. And when you see it in the loan estimate, it looks this and even more confusing. But again, those are government documents that we have to send out. Any questions on that? Can you see why the borrower doesn't know and they talk about closing costs and the only thing the borrower does is look at this number right here? And they're just wondering, where is this coming from? So I have a tool for you that you can use. I'll send you an email with it if you want it. This goes back a little ways. I did this, I don't know, maybe two years ago or so. I gotta find it here. That one happened to be conventional. That one was a conventional loan. Um, I, did a, I did a PowerPoint presentation where I actually was the voiceover. So it's, it's a PowerPoint with a voiceover, it's not an actual video. But what this does is this covers, and it's five minutes and, 40 sec five minutes and 41 seconds long. But this is something you can send to your borrower regardless of what lender they're using. They don't have to use me, you can just send it to them. This answers the question about what expenses are you going to have at closing. Now I'm not going to take the time to play the whole thing, but I want to show you some parts of it. My name is Greg Janicki, and I look forward to spending the next few minutes with you discussing your association. Let's begin with your down payment. This takes, this goes through every one of the five things that the borrower is going to have at closing, including the down payment. Takes all of the guesswork out of it. Well, then the borrower says, but I'm not going to have a homeowner's association. I'm not, okay, fine. Then you're only going to have these four. You got a high-end borrower who says, well, I'm putting down 50%. I don't want to have escrows. That's fine. You don't have to. You're still going to have prepaids, but you're not going to have escrows. Most, that's not for most people, as you know. Most people are going to have generally four of these or five of these. It takes each one of them and breaks them down one by one so that there's no questions and it explains it to them. I don't know how to, I don't know how to make it any simpler than what I have put on here. It even says subtract your earnest money from your total down payment. So it shows them what's going to happen with their earnest money. Did you ever get the question? What's going to happen with my earnest money? Give them this video. If they will watch it, it tells them what's going to happen with it. Takes all of the guesswork out of it. Closing costs. Now it's going to break this down. Let me just see. I thought there was a... Nope. It goes right to there. So what it does here is it's going to break it down by the various sections that they're going to have. This is lender fees. Attorney fees, state taxes. There's no question. The borrower's going to know if you go into this section here.
Now it takes them into prepaids. Oops, what happened? Origination fees. It even tells them they may or may not have origination fees. Now it's interesting, there's been a lot more with discount points and origination fees in the last um, four months. I just read something today. In fact, I think my company sent it out on my behalf to all of you. You might want to just look at it um, because what it, says, what it says is that they have found that almost 70% of buyers are now paying some form of origination fee or discount points since last September, which is very different than what we had in the past. Takes them through prepaids. Does, I don't believe, no, this does not go into short pay. Thank goodness. Talk about confusing. Homeowners insurance. This is why prepaids are going to be the same for every lender. <laughs> There's not going to be any difference. I mean, if one, if one lender is offering a six and a quarter rate and the other six and a half, yeah, there'll be a couple dollars of interest difference, but there's no other difference in prepaids. This helps explain all that. Takes them through escrows. At the time of closing. Next. Explains to them how this works and why this is varies. And the one thing this does not do, and I hope you're doing it, if you have someone who's buying a $500,000 home and, they, and the property taxes on your listing that they're buying are showing that the property taxes are only $200 a month. I hope you're doing what I'm doing because I don't want to come behind you and make us look bad, but I'm telling the people, you might get $200 this year, but start putting another $250 a month in your savings account because when that tax bill comes out, it's going to probably be higher. The counties and cities have not completely caught up with their assessments. They're using home sales to trigger those assessments. So be aware, and if you see something really low, you know, don't be afraid to go use the estimator that most counties have on their website today. Um, association dues. This is something that in the contracts over the last three years, Georgia Association of Realtors has done a great job with the new, with the GAR forms, and they're getting better. And I read through the changes even this year. Hopefully, there are no, if you're the buyer's agent, every one of those boxes should be filled out, or the seller is going to be paying. If you're the listing agent, I would never, if I'm a listing agent, I would force myself to put zero or NA or something in every one of those boxes just so that I can't make the mistake of not putting something in and then my seller gets caught at closing with a three, four, five, six hundred dollar expense because we didn't put something in there that should have been put in on that disclosure. So association, and, that, and those things come up. And those things are all lumped into that Koofy closing expense. This is not, I mean, it's a closing expense. It's not a closing cost, closing expense. And who's paying it? I break it down here, similar to what the GAR form shows. But the GAR form kind of lumps some of these together, as you know, which makes it easier. It even talks about who can pay. Who can pay for this stuff? Because they don't have to pay for it all. <laughs> right now, you can get seller concessions in some cases. But in four months, five months from now, if you can get seller concessions, I think it's going to be because somebody's desperate to sell at too high a price. Because I don't see how we're going to get seller concessions when the demand comes off the fence. Bill mentioned they're on the fence. When that comes off, which is coming off for sure, when that does, I don't think there'll be as many seller concessions again. So then it even tells them how much can be paid by the various people. Again, most of this stuff 
you're helping them with if you're using the buyer's expenses at closing. But if not, this crazy five minutes and 41 seconds is going to walk them through what they can do, how to do it, and save you and them a lot of headache. So if you want this, send me a quick email or a text, and right after, I'll send you the link to this YouTube video. It's a YouTube video. Again, five minutes, 40 seconds. I use it a great deal. I always, I just have it in my signature, and I just have to put in their name, click the signature, it automatically says, see this, five minutes and 41 seconds, here's the link, go. Makes it very simple. But again, it's a great tool so that you don't have to try to explain it all to them, even though you still might want to, but this just walks them through it. Any questions? Spanish all right. Spanish version? <laughs> you know what we could do? We could do the video and we could change the voiceover. You just have to put your voice on it. We'll go in the podcast room, put your voice over that, and if you want to, we can sure try it. Sure. We should have it in Spanish, though, yeah. yes. We really should. That's a good idea. Yeah, we can do that. The, again, it's just a PowerPoint presentation. We can use any voice over it. Right. You can say, this is my buddy Greg, but I was going to be my voice. You know, you know, you'd rather listen to Joanna talk anyway rather than Greg. So we'll just take one of you who's willing to do this. We'll do it. We'll put it on there, and we can have, then we'll have the Spanish version. I love it. Any other questions? All right, thanks everybody.